Mark, thank you very much. I think a very enlightening talk gives us a little bit more of an insight into uh, maybe some of the thinking. Uh, you do indeed have your final report coming out very shortly, so I, I think we might start with a question on that. Give everybody a chance to uh, key, uh, to queue up a few questions. So uh, please, so we've got a few, so if we get some, well, maybe, maybe actually what a question is, so let's start with that, and I'll come back to my, my question a bit later. Good, excellent. Tim Decker from HSBC. Mark, you talked about, uh, or you likened banking in some respects to a profession, like the medical profession. Um, one of the things that's lacking in our profession is a, is a common educational professional standards. Is that something that your reports are considering? Um, Yes, it is. I mean, I think that the, um, as I say, I don't want to give away too much of what the report is going to have, um, not least because it's, it has, it's sort of in the early drafting stages. But um, when you look at a bank, I mean, one of the arguments that the banks present to us is that you have an awful lot of different types of businesses. You have investment bankers, merchant bankers, you know, all sorts of different people within it. And yet at the end of the day, a bank has a common set of, uh, of principles. You know, what is a bank? A bank is actually ultimately just a balance sheet with, uh, with customers on either side of it. But there are certain things which are important that I think everybody who works within a bank should understand. You know, what does it actually do? Why does it perform an important social function? You know, how does it go about, in the broadest sense, delivering that function? Why is it important to have customers and not just simply proprietary trade? That type of very, very basic stuff provides a commonality across the, the whole of the, of the piece for banking, irrespective of what part of the, of the institution you work for. And within all of that, um, would be, uh, you know, if you have that sort of training at the bottom level, you have an opportunity to provide the ethics side of things. You know, why is it important to have good ethics? Why is it important to understand that the consumer doesn't understand uh, banking, and therefore you, as a, uh, as a as a practitioner of banking, have a degree of trust which you have to have to maintain or you know be trusted. So I think that commonality is very important. Obviously, from then on afterwards, you will have you know compliance exams for compliance officers. You'll have um, you know sort of the the. the um, you know, independent financial advisors will go off and do their exams and all the rest of it. But at the bottom level, you have a commonality. And I think that's certainly where we need to be heading. We have another question here. Thank you very much. Uh, Peter Norman, I'm a writer and uh, on post-trade issues, a journalist, and here today as a member of the European Post-Trade Group, which is trying to promote the Giovannini barriers or getting rid of them. But I'm not going to ask you about that. I was very interested about what you were saying about account portability and the need to renew IT in connection with that. And I'd just be interested, I mean, how do you see getting there? I mean, who would do the renewal of the IT? IT. Is this to be done bank by bank, or um, at what level is it to be joined up? If so, how? And given the very dubious um, uh, achievements of Britain in renewing IT, not least at um, government level over the last mm. decade and a half and more, I mean, would it work? Well, Vocalink are the people who, who deliver the infrastructure. Um, and so Vocalink will, will need to be working on that to deliver it. The problem at the moment lies with the fact that the, the, in, the interface between Vocalink and the banks lies at the uh, sort code, the branch sort code. And that essentially means that, you, that everything beyond that then comes under the remit of the bank itself. What's being looked at is attaching the account number to the sort code, which therefore means you could then potentially move the account number together with the sort code around the system. Um, it's just, without getting sort of too technical about it, because I'll bore everybody, sensitive I do. Um, you're, you're essentially changing some of that, uh, that, that account number, or in fact a lot of that account number management to the central utility system and away from the banks. If you were simply doing that for that one objective, I think there's a very valid argument that actually it would be too expensive. But if you look at, as I say, the, the, the problems with banks, I mean, I think probably you're in a better position to tell me or agree with this, but according to the Bank of England's analysis, about 80%, as I said, of, of, of spend on IT within banks is to do with trying to patch up legacy systems. And you look at something where HBOS and Lloyds merged, it's taken, I think, four years to try and get the IT systems to link together. Clearly, we have a system or an IT system which is now, you know, goes back a very, very long way. And of course, they are, a lot of them are very, very diverse types of systems. So if you could bring your, your core infrastructure under one roof, 
you can then provide the services that banks want to provide as a, as a much more bespoke uh, IT offering, which can then link into this core infrastructure. But the key point is, is that you can move a bank account from one institution to another, or indeed one branch to another. I don't know if anybody's ever wanted to move branch, but it is as difficult as moving bank for the, you know, the, the, the sort code reasons. So the IT infrastructure thing is very, very important. But as I say, when you then add this to the, to the other issues, which are um, uh, transparency of the system, so the FPC needs to know, it would be helpful if the FPC knows what's going on in the system, and, and resolvability in the case of, uh, of a fading bank, you end up with what looks like the best part of a perfect storm of reasons why you should go with this. The cost of it will be met by the private sector. Um, this will be done, and ultimately, of course, then the consumer. Um, but the but vocal link would be the ones who would be doing, obviously, the, what's internal to their system. Uh, and then, obviously, the banks would be looking at their own their own infrastructure. Um, I'm not going to pretend it's going to be cheap, um, but it's, I think it's always better if you have a private sector looking at this because they're much better at managing costs than the public sector. And I think we've seen that, as you so rightly say, with, um, with government IT spends. Um, I think it's been 700 million or 800 million to do the seven day switching. And I think it is important that we give that a chance and see how that beds down. Um, but if we look back on when the telephone, mobile telephone companies were looking at uh, telephone number portability, they complained bitterly that it was going to be impossible to be able to do it. And yet now we wouldn't dream of, of, of changing our telephone number every time we wanted to change provider. This, I think, is an inevitable process. It's really a question of, of at what point do we collectively, as a, as a society and as a, as a banking industry, bite the bullet and get on with it? Because I do believe we're going to have to do it at some point. And if you're spending so much money on just dealing with your legacy systems and the chewing gum and sellotape that holds it together these days, um, at what point do you say enough's enough? We've got to stop spending money there and spend money on something brand new. Mm. Indeed. No, that, let me just pick up on that, and, and, and maybe we'll have time for one or two more questions, so just uh, do think of uh, your questions. But just to pick up on that and maybe make a little bit of a link to, to competition, because you referred to the competition mm. issue. Um, and although uh, account portability, I, I think, fine, it's the right direction to take, Will we really see, um, the idea is to create and foster competition. Um, and we know the inertia in, in, in consumers, people don't change uh, accounts. Um, partly because the reason is there isn't a lot of competition between the services that are on, on offer. So, and you, you referred earlier on to it's hard to get in. We've seen many um, attempts to sell branches by the big banks mm. fail. How are we going to really foster some greater competition within the industry? I think the problem is that we, that we all the banks look the same. It's a bit like political parties is all a bit the same as people complain to me on the doorstep. The, um, we need to have diversity in terms of banking. I mean, I think it's very interesting to see someone like Metro Bank start up in London. And they've had to overcome a huge barrier to entry. But they look at it in a very, very different way. They employ their staff, I believe, by their, their personality and their amenability. And then they work out if they're any good at counting. Um, but they believe that actually that, that welcoming um, sort of image at their branches is more important in order to give the customer a far better experience and indeed their pets and indeed their children. Um, and that is a way that some people will, you know, that is the type of bank that some people will aspire to. Aldermore Capital is not a high street, you know, it's not a bank with, with current accounts, but it fills a niche in the market where people who want business loans can go to someone like Aldermore. Um, at the high end, you have people like C. Hor & Co. or Adam or Coots or whatever, where you have these kind of quasi-private banks. Um, which are there for the um, for TOFs, I suppose, who want to feel exclusive. Um, at the other end, you have the building societies, uh, and you have the co-op. What we need is more diversity in the banks. We, what we don't need is more Lloyds, more HSBC, more you know, Barclays. We need more diversity. We, and, and I believe that there's a lot to be said for regional banks who understand regional uh, dynamics. Um, and go back, not entirely to a sort of Captain Mannering type of model, uh, because I think we all do hark on for those halcyon days mm. slightly with rose-tinted spectacles. But I think we do need something that is slightly different that is going to respond more to what people's needs are. But I do think it's incredibly important that if we're going to provide all this diversity and provide all this competition, people need to have the understanding of what this is all about. And this is why financial education is so incredibly important. There's a question here. Yeah. I was listening to a number of your debates on the Parliamentary Commission on Banking Standards. Uh, this is to do with the trade-off between innovation and regulation. Um, if you look at faster payments, uh, account switching and mobile, they are all 
uh, not regulated. They were actually by a big stick by various people, OFT and yourselves and others. Uh, the faster payments in particular is looked on by in great admiration by most other countries in the world. As you may be aware, Australia is introducing something called RTP, which is an immediate payment type thing. Singapore, Canada is looking at it. So if these things were that bad, then actually other countries wouldn't be saying these things are you know, good. It's clearly they're good. So the, 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 the idea of introducing a, a payments regulator, do you not think that will not only um, potentially introduce planning blight into the UK for two or three years because it's going to take you time to work that through how it's going to work. There's a consultation paper now. But secondly, don't you also think that it will actually uh, have the, the, the unintended consequence of stifling innovation when it's a time we're actually expecting more innovation in payments from new entrants, etc.? I think that's an incredibly wise and perceptive question. Um, I think the first thing is, is you're absolutely right. We are very good at what we do in this country, and I think sometimes we spend too much time knocking it. But that's not to say that we shouldn't be striving to continue to be better. The last thing we want to do is to find ourselves complacently thinking we're the best in the world and discover that the rest of the world has caught up and passed us. So we do need to be driving things forward. Um, with regards to regulator, you're absolutely right. I mean, a regulator could come in and, and, and do exactly that. But that's the job of things like the Treasury Select Committee and, and Parliament to, to, to keep an eye on this. And it's incredibly important that the, the banks uh, and people who want to come up with this innovation keep us in, in, you know, informed with what's going on. Um, ultimately, Parliament can't turn around to the regulator and say, no, you have got this wrong, we will overrule you, because the whole point about an independent regulator is that they're independent. Um, and actually, you would hate it if Parliament re responded to every single complaint about something that's going wrong, because you would have such an unstable regulatory regime, it would be too difficult for anybody to manage and would drive away competition for that reason. Um, but nonetheless, um, holding the regulator to account is, is incredibly important. We are you know, going through a period of change anyway. We've got, we'll, if we have a payments regulator, we've also got the FCA and the, and, the, uh, and the PRA coming through, and we're waiting to see how they bed down. We are in a period of extreme regulatory churn in this country, and actually globally, there's an awful lot going on. And it is making it very, very difficult for people to, um, to plan for any sort of long-term future you know, prospects. Um, there is a big question on this is, do we wait and let this bed down and then bring in a re another regulator in a bit in the future, or do we just mash it all up together and, and get on with it now? It's an incredibly difficult question, but my advice to, to all of you is, if you think something's going wrong, for goodness sake, get in touch with, um, with the Treasury Select Committee, your trade bodies, and, and your local members of parliament, because we, we can bring some pressure to bear on the regulators. I think we've got time for one more question. Um, gentleman here. When you're talking about the um, account portability, um, it also goes with the, the corporates or the customer having their deposit getting shifted to another bank. Is it something like uh, you know, like a share market? Like you know, it's basically bank depends on the you know, the amount of capital. So if people start moving from one bank to other bank with their capital, is, is there any kind of control? Because those people can have a, a certain kind of uh, implement control over the bank, the way they exit. Because there's a uh, instability uh, is possible. How that can be controlled? It, it, again, a very, very interesting question. The, the, the essence of your question is, is, could you effectively have a run on the bank by switching accounts? And if you can do overnight switching, could you, I mean, and could you create a run which has the effect on the capital? Uh, that is one of the risks, absolutely. And in the modern day with, uh, with modern um, you know, communications and Twitter and Facebook and all this kind of stuff, um, you know, potentially a run on a bank could be generated um, instantly or very, very quickly through a Twitter feed. Um, the question is, uh, really, is it going to be any different having full account portability, sort of overnight account portability? Is it going to be any different from actually people going along and withdrawing their money uh, as quickly as they possibly can? Um, it may not be the same, but it is, it is absolutely a risk. This is something which the Financial Policy Committee needs to be looking at in terms of, in terms of st the systemic stability of the banking system um, and, is, and is part of the big mix which they have to look at. But it is, it is a very, very fair question. Mark, thank you. 
Um, I think I will stop it there. Uh, and thank you, Mark, for taking time out of an incredibly busy day. Um, I think that hopefully gave a little bit of insight and, and helped the dialogue uh, between the, uh, the, the Westminster end of the city and the city end of the city. So uh, uh, thank you very much for your time. And please, uh, a, a warm round of applause for Mark. Thank you. Thank you.